Before their album Nevermind became a huge success, something crazy happened at Nirvana's release party on Friday the 13th in September 1991. Did you know that Nirvana was kicked out of their own release party? And Chris Novoselic even begged to be let back in. Now the big question is, were Nirvana acting unprofessionally or were they justified? You get to decide. Stay tuned as we explain all the factors that led up to this wild incident. Now let's rewind to the pre-Nevermind era. Back then, only a few rock bands like Guns N' Roses and Skid Row, Metallica and Van Halen had reached the top spot on the charts. However, Nevermind changed everything. Within two years, bands like Pearl Jam, Soundgarden, and Alice in Chains not only topped the charts, but also smaller bands like Mud Honey and the Melvins were getting signed by big record labels. The band worked really hard during rehearsals. They practiced for about 10 hours every day for six months straight. They did this because Kurt really wanted to make a successful album. To keep themselves going, they even used a heater to stay warm and motivated to keep playing late into the night. According to their record producer, Butch Vig, the band's tightness and preparation made the recording process relatively smooth, with minimal editing needed on the album. That's why we got on the first take. Butch worked with them for a bit over a month to record and mix Nevermind at Sound City Studios in Van Nuys, California. Originally, they planned for three weeks, but it ended up for taking longer. In fact, Kurt had a different vision for Nevermind from the beginning, even for the album cover. He initially wanted a baby to be born underwater. However, the childbirth scene was proved to be too graphic and impractical for an album cover. After ruling out the childbirth idea, Fisher started exploring other options featuring babies underwater. He eventually added a fish hook to make it more menacing. As for the music, Kurt expressed dissatisfaction with the production for its perceived commercial sound. He later told biographer Michael Azarad, I never listened to Nevermind. I haven't listened to it since we put it out. I can't stand that kind of production. And I don't listen to bands that do have that kind of production, no matter how good their songs are. It just bothers me. But Butch Vig has another theory. He said, I think part of that was Kurt's reaction to having Nevermind be so successful. If it had only sold 50,000 copies, he probably wouldn't have had any comments on whether it was too slick or not slick enough. During the recording of Nevermind, Nirvana was living in an apartment complex in Van Nuys, California. The band members were residing in chaos with graffiti on the walls and overturned couches. Their messy lifestyle included staying up all night and going down to Venice Beach until the early morning hours. Butch Vig recalls, a couple of times I went to pick them up and they had definitely turned their place into a bachelor pad. There were cans of food lying open everywhere, clothes thrown all over the place and acoustic guitars lying around the room. I know they were getting a big kick out of staying there because the band Europe was staying next to them. They were staying right across the pool from Europe. Now the band Europe had had that big, the final countdown. It was yes. a massive hit, right? Oh, yeah. They yeah. were all really good looking guys, really skinny, <laughs> long blonde hair, beautiful girlfriends, living large. Little did they know that Nevermind was going to come out and drive the nail into that type of metal that was getting airplay at the time. Photographer Chris Cafaro had the chance to take pictures of the band Nirvana while they were making their album Nevermind. This was right after Dave Grohl joined the band. Here is how he described their encounter. We met at a diner and had bit to eat before we got started. Back then, they were so poor I paid for lunch and they couldn't be happier. We walked over to one of the alleys close by and just started shooting. Kurt jumped up on the trash can to rest. He had a long night having a bit too much fun. After the shoot, we all went for a drink and took care of our hangovers. One last thing, it was this shoot where I met Kurt. He was a gentle soul and through the years was always nice to me. We had many great moments and I'll always be grateful. Let's jump ahead to Friday, September 13, 1991. The band celebrated Nevermind at Rebar in Seattle. The venue was a popular spot for grunge punks, misfits, drag queens, poets, and celebrities, known for its counter-cultural atmosphere. Originally, the party was supposed to be a casual event for the band to invite their friends and family. 
It was also meant to be a listening party, where people from the music industry would come to listen to the album on a sound system. But it ended up being fancier than expected. The DJ played Nevermind two times in a row. The band had to socialize with people from the music industry. It was all set up to be a classy affair with delicious food, drinks, prizes. However, the party took a turn for the worse when the band began misbehaving. The event was serving beer only, so Cobain's mate Dylan Carlson snuck in a bottle of whiskey, which he hid in the rebar photo booth. In Everett True's book, Nirvana the Biography, Carrie Borzillo outlines how things went south from there. When the free beer ran out, it wasn't long before some of the edible food promised on the invitation started flying across the room. Apparently, the first food item to be hurled was a tamale thrown by Chris at Cobain and Carlson. Kurt then threw some guacamole back at his bandmate. As you can imagine, that quickly kicked things off, leading Steve Wells, the owners of Rebar at the time, to throw the guests of honor out of the party along with some others. They ended up out on Howell Street where there was allegedly some puking and sarcastic begging to be let back inside before the guys were picked up and taken to another place to cause more trouble. Screaming Trees guitarist Gary Lee Connor shared his memory of the night, saying, What a fun time. I think they probably saw this thing as a big joke in the first place. For some reason, no alcohol was allowed, but Dylan Carlson had a bottle of whiskey and was serving it inside the photo booth machine. Felt like sneaking alcohol in high school. After this, everyone retreated back to Charles Peterson's downtown loft to continue the party. But Kurt soon set off a fire extinguisher and everyone had to leave. That's when I bailed so I don't know if there was any more fun that night. Now, what do you think? Would you prefer the band to act professionally and stick to the plan? Or do you like seeing them be true to themselves? Share your thoughts in the comments. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't already.